How's it going, folks? We're back with our second presentation for our Debates Great series with Sarah Sanchez from Noddle. As the National Program Manager at Noddle, Sarah Sanchez is responsible for national volunteer engagement and national public debate initiatives. Additionally, Sarah serves as the Urban Debate National Championship Tournament Director. Hey, Joseph, thanks for having me. Oh, sorry. She serves as the tournament director and manages all social media platforms and communication efforts at Noddle. She brings 10 plus years of debate ex and coaching experience to her role, where she, she was also previously an assistant debate coach at Roland Hall St. Mark's Upper School in Salt Lake City and the director of debate at Illinois. She's a Barkley Forum key coach and has served as a board member of the National Debate Coaches Association and is a member of the Tournament of Champions Policy Advisory Committee. In addition to her expertise in debate, Sarah is passionate about public education. She spent seven years as a classroom teacher, three years as a research analyst at the Utah Foundation, focusing primarily on education issues, and more recently held the role of Managing Director of Policy for Educator for Excellence, an advocacy organization for teachers in Chicago. Sarah has a bachelor's in political science from the University of Utah. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to our wonderful host. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Joseph. I'm really excited to speak to Lambda debaters today. Um, he did an awesome job of introducing me. So I am just gonna jump right in here. Today, we're talking about leveraging debate for career opportunities. And as I'm sure a lot of people who are watching this would agree, uh, debate has been the single most impactful activity that I did out of everything I've done in my life. Like if you were to ask me what had the biggest impact and where I am right now, why I'm talking to you, it would be debate. And that's not just because I currently work as the national program manager for the National Association for Urban Debate Leagues. In every job I've had, whether I was a docket clerk at a patent law firm when I was in college or whether I was a research analyst at Utah Foundation, as Joseph just talked about, debate has been the thing that has gotten me to where I am today. So I wanted to take some time today and talk about the reasons that debate is so important and just offer you some insight that I've gained over 20 plus years of professional experience as to why debate is so important and how you can leverage those elements of debate that are gonna be critical for you, to, for your career and your life going forward. So we're gonna talk about that in three big buckets today. Um, I think it's true there, and there's different elements in all of these that we'll get into, but I think that debate is super important for building your network, it introduces you to people who are gonna put you in contact with opportunities that you may not have otherwise had. It develops skills that employers and other people will want that they find desirable and they will wanna hire you because you're good at certain things. And there are just a few key debate concepts that I come back to again and again. And every time I find myself in a position where I'm wondering, hey, how do I get out of this particular jam? Or how do I get people on board for a policy idea that I have? These have been the most influential for me. So I'm gonna share those with you and hopefully you can fast forward through some of the lessons I learned today. Um, before I get to that though, I wanna give you a little bit of an idea of who I am beyond titles that I've held and places that I've been employed. Uh, this is my little hometown. This is a map of Utah and in the highlighted area there, that little tiny town is a place called Price. It's a coal mining community. It's about an hour away from the nearest mall. It's two hours away from Salt Lake City. Um, and Salt Lake City is in fact a city, but it's not really a city like a big city like LA. <laughs> it's a pretty small metropolitan area, all things considered. In fact, I looked it up and in 2010, there were 8,715 people in my little hometown of Price, Utah. Now, don't get me wrong, there are lots of great things in Price. Um, if you like running around the desert, it's an awesome place to be. If you like national parks, you're like within driving distance to five of them and it's incredible. Uh, there's a world-class dinosaur museum in Price, Utah, fun fact. But for me, when I was 15 years old, the most important thing that existed in Price, Utah was the debate team at Carbon High School. And the reason for that was really simple. Debate introduced me to people who would be influential for my entire life. Some of those people were my teammates. Some of those people were coaches at other schools. Some of those people were people that judged me in debate rounds. But those were all people that had a huge impact in how I saw myself and the opportunities that I took advantage of later. 
debate also puts you in spaces that maybe you didn't see yourself before. So I spent a lot of time on college campuses all throughout high school, whether I was going to a debate camp or whether I was going to a tournament. And I felt so much more comfortable, even as a first generation college student in college later, because I had spent so much time in those environments going to debate tournaments. Um, and I think debate also changes what we believe is possible for ourselves. It very much changes the limits of what we see ourselves doing because we get to know people who are doing things that maybe aren't the same things that we were seeing in our neighborhoods or aren't the same things that we were seeing from our peers. And it lets you know that you belong in those spaces and there's a space for you at those tables. So let's talk about each of these. Uh, debate introduces you to people. And I know everybody who's watching this Lambda types uh, know Cam Ward <laughs> really well. Cam is one of my dearest friends in debate. And ironically, we didn't get to know each other as competitors. We don't quite overlap there. But he did debate in college with a friend of mine, Josh Clark, who I debated against in high school. And it just goes to show you that the debate community is a small space. And the people that you meet, not just in high school, but people that you'll meet later in college who are connected to people you knew in high school and people who are connected to them will open doors for you later. And these are people that you'll be able to go to with questions or expertise at various points in time. I mean, just to, as a small, small example of this, you know, I debated against Josh when I was growing up in Price, Utah. He was a student at Jordan High School in Salt Lake City. Uh, Josh then later debates with Cam. The three of us wind up being debate coaches at about the same time along the West Coast regional circuit in the early 2000s. So we see each other all the time. And since that time, you know, I've moved to, I moved to Boston and ran the Lexington debate program in Massachusetts for six years. I've since moved to Chicago where I now work with Noddle. Josh has moved to Utah and then to Tennessee where he uh, is an awesome debate coach at Montgomery Bell Academy, which is one of the best debate programs in the country. And as you all know, Cam uh, built the Los Angeles Metropolitan Urban or Metropolitan Debate League, which is why we're all having this conversation today. And he's currently working in risk management. And that's just a small way that people get connected through debate and that those connections build on each other and all of our experiences then come together. And I know that if I ever need um, an expert in debate in Tennessee, I can call Josh. And if I am ever looking for an expert in risk management in California, I can call Cam. Those are just two out of the thousands of people that I've been able to encounter through this activity. You are quite literally building your network and your Rolodex now full of people and you have no idea where they'll wind up. One of the members of my high school debate squad runs one of the biggest event planning um, organizations in Utah. And so if I ever, you know, find the right guy and get married, I know <laughs> that I can go to her to plan a wedding. Um, I know people who are getting PhDs in everything from political science to particle physics. And those are all connections that you can draw on time and time again. It's not just competitors though, because the people that you're competing against now, you don't know where they're gonna wind up in 20 years. There will be awesome stories that you'll be able to tell like the ones I just did, um, but it's other coaches too. Uh, to this day, I'm friends with various people who ran debate labs that I was in when I was a 15 and 16 year old. And those people are also doing awesome things and they're connected to big institutions. They're connected to universities. They're connected to political campaigns. They're connected to foundations that fund things like debate and other things. Those are connections that people keep throughout their lives. And we all have this shared experience of debate that we know creates a certain type of skill set and a certain type of expertise, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, that gives us the confidence that we can all work together and that we can trust the competence of that other person. And then the last element of people that I want to talk about that we get to interact with in this incredible activity on a regular basis are judges. Um, in a lot of urban debate leagues, our judges are experts in the community who already have an affinity for state. And they're volunteering because they know how important debate was to them. And they want to make sure that they reach out and make connections to new debaters like you. 
These are people who are giving up hours of free time because they would they think the best use of that time is to listen to your arguments and give you feedback. And you should take them up on that, but you should also continue to hone those relationships. One of the most influential people when I was a young coach in Utah happened to be a lawyer um, who just really loved debate and he was around the circuit all of the time. And to this day, he checks in on me and just asks how I'm doing, asks what I'm up to. And I know that if there is ever, if I ever need to find somebody with legal expertise in Salt Lake City, Utah, that I can reach out to Robert Wing because that man has a debate connection with me and we have known each other for 20 plus years now. And those are the types of relationships and the types of connections you're building now. So make sure that you're following up on them and really nurturing those relationships going forward. But it's not just the people that you meet because debate also puts you in the room where it happens as Hamilton would say. Um, you are spending time right now on college campuses. You're spending a significant amount of time on college campuses, whether it, it is tournaments at Long Beach or Fullerton, debate camp or tournaments at USC. These are all spaces that are critically important to your future and you already know them very well. You have access to them you can feel comfortable in them. You know that there are people on campus who have your back and who are your friends. And that is so important when you go to a large university, particularly if you don't necessarily know a ton of other people there. Being able to see yourself in those spaces and know that there are people who are already there who can help you is absolutely critical. I mean, I mentioned earlier, I'm a first generation college student. So I didn't have family members that I could really go to to ask what it was like to live in a dorm or to talk about what it was like to juggle my part-time job with my class load while trying to keep a scholarship. And the fact that I had debate friends in those areas who I could talk to about that was really important. Knowing that there were people in the communications department who knew me as a person, not just me as another student on campus was critically important. So knowing the spaces that you're in and being comfortable in them is important and debate gives you access to that. In addition to college campuses, debate gives you access to corporate spaces. So I don't know how many people watching this have participated in events like Noddle's financial literacy event um, or maybe flip the debate, but those are public debate initiatives that we do that generally um, the capstone of those is a public debate and exhibition debate where we try to host it in a corporate space or at bare minimum with some experts from the financial sector or from the political sector who give feedback for those rounds. That gets you into what an office space looks like. And I didn't have access to that when I was a high school student. I had no idea what it was like to work at an office until I got a job as a docket clerk at one of the largest patent law firms in Salt Lake City, Utah. Incidentally, a job that I got through debate connections. So this is one of those times where you know, I wound up with a part-time job that gave me some really critical connections and experiences. And that happened because of experiences that I had already had in debate. That meant that I felt a lot more comfortable when I took my first job um, and internship at Utah Foundation that turned into a research analyst position because I knew what it was like to walk into an office building. I knew what it was like to present in one of those rooms. I knew what it was like to sit in a corporate boardroom. And those aren't experiences that we all get in high school, but debate opens those doors for you and you should absolutely take advantage of it. The last one I'm gonna talk about is actually one that I don't really love all that much, but it has its place. And I think that you all should consider these opportunities every time you get to participate in one and that's fundraisers. Um, fundraising is not my favorite thing, but it's absolutely critical to what we do here. We need people who support urban debate to fund it if we want it to continue and to grow. And when we host fundraisers like an annual dinner or a luncheon, it puts debaters and young alumni in the room with people who are financially able to fund this activity, who already believe that this activity is great for students and for the people who um, support the activity. And so those fundraisers are a time for you to make connections with people who have resources and already believe in debate. What better opportunity is there than to get on, to get some of those people in your Rolodex so that you know later when somebody's looking for an internship or somebody is trying to figure out who can be their next assistant, 
that is somebody that you already know appreciates the debate skills that you have. They can give you feedback in your field, even if you, even if that was the only time that you ever met them. In addition to giving you tons of connections and putting you in spaces that are important to other people, at least for me, debate changed my horizons. It meant that I was able to say yes to a lot of things that I might have been too shy to take on if I hadn't done this activity. And I'm gonna start actually with non-debate opportunities because I think that saying yes to being on a college debate team after being on a high school debate team is a great thing to do. I did it for a year, I was really excited about it. Um, my program actually kind of fell apart after a year and I was faced with a decision as to whether I wanted to try to transfer and set up in an entirely new different school so I could debate or if I wanted to build on the ties that I'd already established for myself at the University of Utah. I chose the latter and I've never really regretted that because I got a ton of experiences both in terms of leadership and in terms of organizing that I probably wouldn't have gotten if I had decided to just focus on debate. And so saying yes to non-debate opportunities is a critically important thing. Uh, if you get the opportunity to design an after-school learning program for a local elementary school, you should absolutely do that. You're gonna learn so many things about students and teachers and the nuts and bolts of how debate programming works that you maybe didn't see as a debater, but you see it when you try to organize the program. Um, similarly, you know, recently in 2016, I got approached with an opportunity to write about baseball. And I have loved baseball my entire life. Um, I've been a huge fan of the Chicago Cubs since I was growing up in Utah. And I felt confident enough to take that opportunity because I knew that debate had trained me to do the things that that opportunity entailed. So even though I didn't have a column somewhere and I didn't have a readership, I knew I could research. I knew I could identify a story. I knew I could communicate, communicate that story to people in a compelling way. I knew I could frame it in a way that was unique that would make people wanna read it. And I knew that I could explain complicated concepts in a way that people would understand them. And for the past almost four years now, I've been able to build a really nice baseball writing brand for myself. And my podcast actually just celebrated its first anniversary. So debate can open doors for you, even in places where you didn't think debate was going to be a huge driver. Uh, you should dream big. Debate is a really hard thing to do. People who do this activity devote hours and hours a week to this activity. In fact, I heard it said on one of the many debate documentaries years ago, and I, I can't remember which one off the top of my head right now, so I'm not gonna be able to accredit it appropriately, that every time a debater gets a new topic, the amount of work that they do on that topic is the functional equivalent of a master's thesis. The amount of research that you put into it over the course of the year, the answers to the answers and the disads and the critiques and everything else. Um, that's a ton of work and the ability to do that over and over and over again on different topics means that you can apply that same process, we're going to talk more about process in a second, to other big projects too. And so when you get approached with projects just because you haven't done them before, you should still feel confident saying yes and trying them out. The last thing I'll say about debate and changing your horizons is that debate teaches resiliency better than just about any activity I've ever seen. Um, most of the people I know in debate are go into a round and pretty early on, they have the experience of losing. And losing is not fun. I was never all that great at hearing that we had lost a round, especially if it was an important round that I cared a lot about or one that was gonna make, make or break us in the tournament in terms of getting to ELIMS. But that ability to hear feedback on things that had not gone particularly well and integrate them for a future round was one of the best lessons that debate ever taught me. It taught me losing a round wasn't the end of the world. Losing a round on the same thing multiple times in a row meant that I just had to go back and practice some stuff some more. So, it really changes the way you look at projects when you believe that it'll be okay if things don't work out because you'll still learn from it and be able to put your best foot forward on the next project. All right, let's talk about skills for a second because I think that the skills that debates teaches, and I'm not just talking about presentation skills or public speaking skills or 
flowing <laughs> or the types of skills that you probably think of as the key debate skills. Although flowing is awesome and you should totally do it. Um, I'm talking more about some meta skills that you get from debate. Specifically process over product, prep time and using it effectively and collaborating with others to a common end. As the national program manager at Not All, large parts of my day are spent organizing and managing big projects. These are projects that will happen, that will work on for months at a time that have a big end result, like the Urban Debate National Championship. And you can't just wake up on a Monday and put together a national championship on a Friday. That isn't how that works at all. You have to do a lot of little things each day in order to make that happen. And you have to devote some time to planning to figure out which little things need to happen in which order to get that ultimate result to go off without a hitch. Debate teaches that. Every time you set out to work on a file, every time you set out to work on an affirmative, you have to think through all of the different components of that argument. You have to think through which types of cards you'll need. You have to plan when you're going to get them. And I think you and I both know that the difference between cutting a file in two days and cutting a file over 20 days is huge. If you do a little bit each day, it doesn't feel like that overwhelming of a thing. Whereas if you try to do it overnight, you're probably not getting all the sleep that you need. And by the time you have to run that argument, it's not gonna go very well. Because of that, debate teaches you how to manage that process and make sure that you're doing a little bit of work each day towards a bigger project. And that's critically important for all sorts of things. It's not just for tournament management. It's also important if you're ever asked to be put in charge of a research project in a scientific setting or in a political setting. It's also super important if you've ever worked on a campaign. One of the things that I do in my spare time is volunteer on political campaigns. And political campaigns are very large projects that happen over a discrete amount of time where a little bit has to happen every single day in order to get the result that you want for your candidate to win. It's impossible to build overnight. You have to devote small amounts of time to it every single day for, in order to be successful. And maybe the most important part of all of this is that it forces you to communicate progress and to fess up to the stuff that isn't going as well along the way. So I'm gonna tell you all a little bit of a story from a couple of years ago at the Urban Debate National Championship. Um, we had the bus contract that takes the students back and forth between the hotel and Georgetown lined up well in advance, like three and a half months in advance. I had a contract ready to go. They had the schedule, everything was going great. 10 days before the tournament, the bus company wasn't really responding to us. We were trying to confirm with them where they were going to be and when they weren't answering us. We were trying to get paperwork that we really needed to make sure that everything was on the up and up and aligned. They weren't answering us. And we had to make the call that we were going to find another bus company to work with seven days before the tournament, which is a terrifying prospect. But the reason it worked is because every other element of the tournament was all aligned. And we were able to identify that there was a problem with the bus company in the lead up to the tournament. We were able to figure that out before we got to Washington DC. So we had buses that showed up every single day for people to take them back and forth to the campus. Can you imagine the disaster that it would have been if there was no bus on the day of the tournament because the bus company just wasn't responding. It allows you to communicate the places that things aren't working so that you can adapt and fix them if you do a little bit each day. And when you focus on process, you don't always win, you don't always get the W, but you absolutely always get a product that you can be proud of. We'll talk about prep time for a minute, which is related to process, but a little bit different. I used to tell my debaters tournaments are one on Wednesday. Nobody wins any debate tournament Friday night prepping to the very last minute. You win debate tournaments by doing a little bit each day so that on Wednesday, the week of the tournament, something like 98% of what you plan on doing during that tournament is already done. It's already ready to go. Everybody knows exactly what their role is. You have a good idea of which arguments you're gonna run when. You have a good idea of how you're gonna answer the arguments people are gonna make, about, make against you. And then you have that spare time, that little tiny extra bit of between round time to deal with the things that come up at the tournament. If you're trying to use that between round time to deal with the stuff that you could have dealt with on Tuesday or Wednesday, then you get overwhelmed by all the new things that come at you during a tournament. And even within a round, be adaptable, right? Like you have a finite amount of time 
to adapt to the little things that your opponents have done that were different than what you anticipated earlier in the week. But if you're prepared, and if you have everything ready to go, you can use that time to the best of your ability to collaborate with your partner and make sure that your answers are as good as humanly possible. It's all about preparation and putting yourself in the best position to use that tiny amount of time that you have in a round in the wisest way possible. Finally, prep time really teaches us about backwards planning. So this is something that teachers talk about a lot. I won't get into the nitty gritty here because I sat through way too many professional development days that were a little bit boring about some of this and I would not do that to you, that would not be cool. But whenever you take a class, your teacher has an idea in their head of what they want you to learn and then they map out backwards how to get you there. Well, when you are in a debate round, you should do something similar. You should ask yourself what the judges are going to vote on in the last speeches and what your two or three best arguments that you want to present to them, whether you're affirmative or negative are, what would be the ideal 2AR or 2NR that you could give that would get this judge to vote for you in this circumstance? And then you reverse engineer the round from those answers to set yourself up to make those arguments. If you wanna go for these three arguments, you have to run these three positions, you have to kick out of these two positions in the block, and you have to make sure that everything is protected in terms of how you respond to stuff before. Backwards planning doesn't just work for teachers, it works in debate rounds, and it also works for almost any big project. Envision where you wanna end up, and then figure out the steps to get there, and map it out so that you do a little bit each day, or each speech. Let's talk about collaboration for a second, because one of the critical skills that you get from debate that isn't really done in the same way in any other class is how you work with your teammates and how you work with your debate partner. I was never the best group project person in high school. I will confess that. I always liked to just do my own thing. I trusted my own work more than other people. And what debate taught me more than anything was that I could rely on my partner and she would come through for me. I will never forget, we were at the Alta tournament, we were in a really big round, and I was doing my thing where, you know, there were 30 seconds left of prep time, and I kept saying, and don't forget this, and, and don't forget this, and, and make sure you answer, and at some point, she just cut me off. She was like, I've got this, and I stopped telling her, like, the seven different things that I wanted her to remember in her 2AR, and I just trusted her, and you know what? She did have it. She had it better than I had it. She had a clearer conception of what she needed to do than any of the reminders I was about to give her that were gonna throw her off her game. I never did that again because I trusted her and I trusted that she knew how to win those arguments and that I, my building blocks would set her up for that and we would collaborate on that. This goes beyond individual debate rounds and partnerships though. It's how you function as a team. I love this picture that I put for this particular slide. This is from the Urban Debate National Championship two years ago. Uh, this is our group from Dallas prepping out before the round. And part of the reason I love this picture is that one of the alumni ambassadors that's working with this particular team used to be a member of that team. And so it really identifies for me the strength of your team. Your team is like your little debate family. And those are the people that come back to help you when you're at the national championship, even when you graduated beforehand. Strong teams win debate rounds. Strong individuals lose. Strong teams get stuff done. And so one of the reasons that debate is such a critically important activity is it teaches us to give other people parts of the load that we know they can handle and then to build on that because as a team, we're stronger together. Um, the last one, I, I put here the name on the back. I couldn't fit the whole title here without it running through the whole thing. So another one of my favorite sayings is the name on the front is a lot more important than the name on the back. Um, this is kind of one of those things that comes up in baseball all the time. In fact, my favorite baseball player of all time, Ryan Sandberg, had this as part of his Hall of Fame induction speech. Great speech. You should listen to it if you get a chance. Um, but what he meant was who you represent, representing Lambdal, representing your school, representing urban debate, that's a lot more important than the individual Sanchez on the back of my jersey. And it's really important that we think about that in the work that we do in debate. And that's the type of mentality that employers across all industries are going to really appreciate when you come into work for them. 
they're not looking for the individual rock star who wants to show off their stuff all the time. Don't get me wrong, you should show off your stuff some of the time. But they want people who are gonna make the entire organization stronger. And to do that, you've got to focus on the name on the front rather than the name on the back and collaborate. I'm gonna leave you before we do some questions with the three debate concepts that have been most influential to me across a bunch of industries. So in very typical millennial fashion, um, I have worked in a lot of different jobs. <laughs> I've worked as the director of debate at some big programs. I've worked as an assistant coach at some programs who were just getting their start. I've worked at nonprofits where I've written research papers and white papers. I've worked at nonprofits where I have uh, collaborated with other teachers to come up with policy solutions to issues that teachers are currently facing. I've written about baseball. I started a podcast. I've worked in political polling. I've done a lot. <laughs> Across all of those industries, these three concepts come up again and again. And half the time when I'm on a team that is struggling to come up with what the next step should be, I ask myself if one of these is going to be applicable to that particular moment. So let's start at the top. Solvency is one of the greatest concepts in debate because it is not enough to be the person who's always trying, who can always see the problems with a particular plan or idea. You also want to come to the table with some ways to solve those problems, or at least an argument that you should that things should stay the same because the problems that are coming don't justify any change, right? It's just a classic presumption argument. The idea of coming to the table with solutions makes you a really valuable member of any organization. That's true whether you're volunteering somewhere or whether you're being paid to solve a particular problem at a job. And that's true whether what you're trying to fix is getting an article out on time or dealing with a technical glitch in some software that you're using to edit a podcast or whether it's working through some complicated um, numeric weights for a political campaign that are going to dictate where somebody should spend millions of dollars on a political ad. Having solutions makes you a really valuable voice of the team. Uh, competition, specifically the permutation. <laughs> A lot of times people get so wedded to their idea and their solution in all environments, in professional environments or any group environment, that they forget that maybe you could do both. That if you can come up with the resources and time, these two things are not mutually exclusive and we can have the benefits of both options if we just restructure how we look at things. And so the idea of competition and two ideas not necessarily being in tension with each other is a really valuable reminder. I, I don't know about you all, but like I think about this sometimes in conversations with my friends or family. We get kind of dug in on our own positions. Like I wanted to do this thing. You wanted to do that thing. Dinner was supposed to be this, not that. A lot of times it's possible to do all of the above or to at least take parts of everybody's idea and work them into a greater solution. And knowing when you can apply a permutation and when, comp when two ideas just are not competitive with each other can really make you kind of the office hero sometimes because you can come up with solutions that people were overlooking. And then finally, uniqueness. A lot of times I think that when people are putting their ideas on the table and they're looking at what solutions might work or not work, they forget whether or not that idea actually functionally shifts the direction of where things are currently at. And so it's important to not just look at your ideas and say, hey, is this a good idea or a bad idea? But is this idea sufficient to change the course and the direction of what I'm trying to change or to avoid the bad direction that I'm trying to avoid? And so that idea of uniqueness or inherency is one of those concepts that I use all the time before I present something. I want to know that what I'm about to present is going to be enough to overcome whatever structural barrier we're trying to deal with at that moment in time. And I, it's one of the concepts that I use almost every day. 
my understanding is that we have some time for questions now. So those are just a few of my thoughts on how debate can have a huge impact for you as you look at possible career options or how you wanna spend your time. And I tried to keep it as applicable as possible to all different fields, but I'm happy to take any questions you have about that. Awesome, thank you for your presentation there. And we've got questions coming in from a few places uh, and you touched on a lot of things. So it's gonna go around in a few different places. Um, but I guess the first question uh, coming in from our Instagram was, uh, your life in Utah, uh, a bunch of us are city folks. Um, how is the transition out of there? Um, and like, how do you spend your time? Like, would you, would you go back? Um, <laughs> uh, so I live in Chicago now. Um, I moved from Salt Lake City to Boston to Chicago. And I live in Chicago for a reason. I love city life. I like the diversity in cities. I like the ability to walk around different neighborhoods. I like exploring um, Chicago. I, I probably would not move back to Utah, I probably would not move back to Salt Lake City um, even, but it doesn't have, that's not because I don't love Utah. I think Utah's got a couple of things going for it that are pretty outstanding. Um, I love nature. I miss being able to like drive 30 minutes into the mountains and just go rock climbing after work, which is not something that I can do in Chicago. I miss being able to take like long weekends to go down to Moab and to Arches and to just climb and walk around and run around the desert. That is definitely not something that I can do in Chicago, but I am grateful for having both of those perspectives because I think that it's not, it's not common to like leave your bubble <laughs> that much anymore. And one of the things I'll always be grateful to debate for is that it gave me the courage to know that I'd be okay outside of a rural environment or that I'd be okay outside of a small city that I was really comfortable. Yeah, that definitely resonates with me too. That it was, at least for me, I didn't really leave my city until uh, debate. Um, I didn't even know San Francisco was in California. I knew it was a thing uh, kind of up in the NorCal, but my perception of even just California was it's all SoCal. Um, so it was through debate, like just going to the Cal tournament and things like that, that sort of helped me sort of get that perspective and the bigger world. So yeah, that definitely resonates with me. Our next question is, uh, what, what is some advice you would tell new judges or folks that just graduated high school that are excited to be on the other side of the table? Oh my gosh, I've spent so much time talking about this. So Joseph, you have to cut me off if I go too long on this. So two Definitely. things. The best thing that I ever did for my debate career was starting to judge rounds. So when I was like a junior in high school, um, through a whole bunch of like quirks and circumstances that we don't really totally need to get into right now, we had a new coach. Uh, and so my partner and I, who were brand new varsity people and knew very little, but you know, enough to get ourselves in trouble, wound up judging a bunch of the novice practice debates. And it was the single greatest thing I ever did for my debate career because I realized that there were so many times I thought I was making arguments completely that judges weren't getting it. Because I kept giving novice debaters feedback like, yeah, I know you think you said that, but what you actually said is this and you need to do this other thing. So it actually fundamentally changed how I debated because I understood that I needed to really follow through on arguments, that arguments I thought I was making completely were not being understood that way by judges. And that small differences in framing and small differences in organization could make a huge difference. Because of that, and because I had that experience, one of the things that I was like very, I don't know if concerned is the right word, but I spent a lot of time thinking about my process for how I made decisions about debate rounds. And I felt like it was really critically important that I had an order of operations for what would go into my decision. So for example, first we're going to look at topicality and then in the absence of topicality being a winner for the negative, then we'll look at theory and then we'll look at these theory arguments in, the, in this order because this is how they would impact each other. And once the theory questions are answered and I understand what the implications of those are for the round, I can look at other issues in this order, right? Um, and the reason, I, I, I'm not going to advocate that anybody else <laughs> go through the process in the exact same way that I do, although I do think that I've like rewritten my judge philosophy about six different times and it's pretty well reflected in there how I make decisions and why. But I think it's important that you think about why you make those decisions and in what order you make them and then do everything in your power to apply those as fairly as possible every single time. 
I consider it a privilege to get to sit in a round and judge it. And I want students to feel heard and I want them to understand why I made the decision that I did. And so I think it's important to have a process that is fair and transparent for articulating that. And you should spend some time and think about it. And if you realize one day that you messed up and that you your process is wrong and you should have done some, something one way and not another way, I think it's okay to come to terms with that too. Just rewrite your philosophy and explain why you changed something. Um, one of the things that I actually spent a bunch of time with my philosophy uh, once I switched over Tanato was rethinking how I looked at different types of debate. And I think that being trans, that's okay. You can change your, your mind on things, but you need to be transparent with people. They need to know where they stand. Yeah, I definitely agree on that last point, at least. Um, it wasn't until I was judging that I could sort of find the value in other forms of debate, at least in high school, it's very policy and policy only. Um, but sort of having that perspective and creating that sort of order operations and figuring out the sort of bigger picture, I didn't really get until I was a judge. Cool. And then our next question, is there anyone that you are rivals with as a debater or a coach oh uh, that you're now friends with um, at this point in your career? Hmm. That's a really good question. So I'm going to, I'm going to fess up to something here, which if any of my friends are watching this, they will 100% agree with. Um, I certainly, I've gotten less competitive in my years in debate. So I am 100% certain that if you had asked me this question seven years ago, the answer would have been yes. And there would have been a list and I would have had reasons and I would have had specific rounds that I was upset about and grudges and this and that. And I can't believe this decision happened this way in 2002 or whatever. Um, I have really kind of abandoned all of that. And it's not, it, it was it was a very gradual process. It wasn't like I woke up one day and I was just less competitive. At some point during my time at Lexington, I got more excited about the fact that the kids on the team would refer to themselves as their debate family than I did about who won or lost. Or I got more excited about the fact that you know, one student in particular who I'm thinking of, uh, you know, finally cleared at his first PF tournament when he was a senior after doing the activity for four years and working really hard and never clearing before that than I did about being in the final round of the TOC. And, and I'm not sure how that process happened. I think part of it is time. I think part of it is maturity. But for whatever reason, as part of that, while I am 100% certain that there are tons of people out there who are like, yeah, in 2010, this was definitely a rival and you were super salty about it. I, I don't actually, I can't actually recall any of that right now. Um, I will say that I am eternally grateful to my high school debate partner, Carol, who is brilliant. She's an appellate lawyer now. Um, and she kept me grounded through high school and kept me from my competitive side, getting the best of us having fun, which was outstanding. And I'm also just grateful to all the students that I got to work with who taught me that it was way more important to have this activity and to experience it than it was to be in the final round and win some trophy that was going to gather dust in a decade. Yeah, that's definitely the kind of perspective that you only get over time. <laughs> it's a um, big thing. Yeah. And then some questions from the chat. Um, so I know you spoke a lot about networking and sort of connecting with folks. How would you recommend folks that struggle talking to people or that are really shy, that don't feel comfortable sort of jumping into those kind of things? Okay. Um, as high school debaters, how can they improve on that? Okay, so uh, I, I, would, I would say I'm confessing a secret, but I'm on a live YouTube, so this is obviously not a confession. I'm an introvert. Uh, you may not believe that after watching this presentation. I'm very good at playing an extrovert for short amount of, amounts of time and like being super energetic and presenting and those types of things. I am most comfortable with a cup of tea, a book and my apartment. Uh, I like thinking and I like reading and I like, like my spending time with my two or three best friends. But it is really important that you use those networking moments to the best of your advantage. And that does not mean that you're going out and talking to every single person. This is a quality over quantity type of thing. So if you find yourself in a room, like a fundraising room, that has 200, 250 people in there, don't feel obligated to go talk to everybody. You do not need to get a business card from everybody. You don't need to give a business card to everybody. But you should take a survey of the room, get an idea of who's there, 
and find two or three conversations that you think are really important for you that you want to have, people you want to make an impression on and that you want to get to know, and make sure you have those conversations. Um, you know, I, I've talked to other people about this who are also <laughs> introverted um, and are really good at working a room. And the advice that they always gave me, which I've taken to heart and has been really helpful for me in my career is it's better to have three or four really solid conversations in a room like that than it is to be buzzing all around the room and give your business card out to 20 people. And then my second piece of advice is, you know, once you get that business card, say you make a connection with somebody who's a big supporter of debate in Los Angeles, you get that business card, you have it in your hand. Don't be scared to ask for it, by the way. I know you don't have business cards as high schoolers. You can still get somebody else's information. Make sure you follow up. Doesn't have to be anything fancy, just within like 36 to 48 hours, a note to them that says, hey, I, I'm so-and-so, we met at the Lambda fundraiser, had a really great time talking to you about X, find something specific that you remember from the conversation. Just wanted to thank you for making the connection with me. If I ever have any questions about why, whatever organization they're with or corporation they're with, I'll be in touch. And that will show them that you remember the conversation and that you care. And that's how you build relationships in a smart way rather than trying to talk to everybody. I'm definitely taking some notes myself. I can be <laughs> doing some more of that. But yeah, I'm a total introvert. I, I, those rooms terrify me and I had, I had to get over it because those rooms are part of life and that's how we do this thing that we do, so. Awesome. Let's see our next question. So this is kind of transitioning into the parts that you're talking about with saying yes to non-debate opportunities. Yeah. But before I do that, were you always a Cubs fan or was it just after oh, you yeah. moved to Chicago? No, no. I, uh, 1984, tiny little me watching the Sandberg game on the Saturday game of the week. That was it for me. And I have been a Cubs fan my entire life. And that was really not the most fun for large portions of my life, but 2016 made it all worth it. Yeah. So on that, on that note, in your sort of experience, like writing for baseball and stuff and, uh, saying yes to non-debate opportunities, uh, for a lot of students, they're super committed to debate, and you know this because you're super. You you've been a super successful coach. Yeah. Um, how do you know when to sort of trade that time off uh, to do these sorts of other things versus like being fully committed into sort of like debate and other things? This is such a smart question, and I'm actually going to um, go back to some advice that I got from students of mine. So one of the great things about teaching is that. Your students teach you so much. Like I, I have learned <laughs> decades worth of lessons from the different students that I got to work with. Um, there came a time right about maybe a couple of years before I was uh, finished coaching at Lexington where I would talk to students who I knew were super good at debate and who would totally excel in college. And they weren't all in on the college debate thing. And you know, I'd have the college coaches who were recruiting them come ask me, how do we get this kid into debate? How do we make sure they're gonna sign up and be part of the team? And, and at that moment in time, my mind was, yes, you've gotta do college debate. You have to do this, you have to do that. Even though I hadn't done it for all four years. So it, you know, like this was obviously a connection that I still needed to make. But I remember having conversations with a couple of those students, particularly students who really wanted to pursue maybe opportunities in the sciences, which are majors that just are a lot more intense than a political science major or a communications major that dovetail nicely with debate. Um, or maybe they were students who had a dream school that was like something they had been working for their entire life and that school didn't have a debate team. And in those conversations with them, I will never forget, and I wish I could credit the person who said this, but I do not remember exactly who it was. Um, in any given year, there's only one team that wins the national debate tournament. There's two teams that win national championships if you count the NDT and CETA. It's four students out of hundreds that have devoted hours and hours and hours to this activity. And the thing about debate education is that it kind of, it plateaus a bit, right? So when you're a novice, you're learning like on an exponential slope because there's, you don't know any of it. You just start learning, learning, learning. And when you're a sophomore, that kind of like tapers off a little bit, but you're still learning like how to apply concepts like solvency, competition, how to research, right? But at some point in your debate career, that kind of plateaus. 
And now you're just, you're learning like marginal things in each round, but you're not learning those huge amounts of information that you were getting from those early debate years. It's up to each individual person when the marginal amount of information that you're getting from a debate round isn't as important as the other opportunities that you have. But speaking for myself, like I was super involved in campus ministry at the Newman Center, which is the Catholic Student Center on campus. And giving that up for the chance to transfer and probably not win that many more rounds didn't seem like something that I wanted to do. And for my students who decided they wanted to be particle physicists or they wanted to be, um, you know, like the world's best expert in some biology thing that I can't even articulate, they made a decision that they had gotten what they needed to out of debate and it was fine for them to go do something else. And so I can't tell you what that's gonna look like for you individually, but I can say it's okay to make that decision and that what you got, you're not gonna lose what you got from the debate. You'll always have a place as a judge. You'll always have a place as a volunteer or a coach if you want it. But you need to know when there are times that you should say yes to non-debate opportunities. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's definitely one of the harder things to judge, especially in the moment where everything feels so big and important. So the oh. next thing I wanted to ask you about was um, your political political campaign experience, like whose campaigns <laughs> did you work on and uh, any tea from behind the scenes about that stuff that you're willing to share? <laughs> um, so I tend to do a lot of local work in Chicago. Um, I've done like a little bit like, again, the introvert thing. I, I'm not huge on like phone banking or for knocking, which is something campaign people hate me for <laughs> because I, it's, it's my nightmare to like knock on a stranger's door and just talk to them about a random candidate. Um, but I decided a long time ago that my strength and I could still be involved in politics using different tools and strengths. So one of the things I do a lot on campaigns is I volunteer to help with data and with signature verification. If you've ever worked on a local campaign, uh, it varies by locality, but in order to get on the ballot, you have to get a certain number of signatures. Those signatures have to get verified that they are actual voters and you didn't just like randomly sign like Minnie Mouse or something on the ballot over and over again. Um, and so I may not be great at like calling strangers and asking them for their vote, but I'm really good at taking a stack of those sheets and making sure that they're correct and accurate quickly. And so I do that um, frequently in Chicago, I work on local campaigns. A friend of mine ran for Alderman, oh, 2017. So not this last cycle, but the one before. It was awesome. It was such a cool experience to work on her campaign. I got to do all of the debate prep for it. Uh, we learned a lot as a group of women just trying to like unseat the political machine in Chicago and made a ton of great connections in the area. But I, those are the campaigns that I tend to work on at the moment, I have not done as much national campaign work, although I do talk about national politics frequently just because I'm interested in it and that is what my degree is in. Awesome. So when you're setting up for these political debates, uh, how much of your sort of traditional debate experience did you have to like translate for a broader audience or how much of it translated well? Yeah, a lot of it translated well is uh, the short answer. Um, mostly it was coaching experience more than actual debate experience. So. The, the two biggest um, components of debate prep that I do, well, actually, let me take a step back. The first thing that I do is try to figure out where a candidate is at because different candidates are at different places in terms of their message, right? So some of them are very good communicators, understand exactly what, what they wanna get forward. Some of them aren't. Some of them don't have a ton of public speaking experience. And so you have to get, you have to get a gauge of who, who you're working with, and then you have to pick and choose the three or four areas that you can have the most impact in. This is a lot like giving feedback in a debate round, by the way, if you've ever judged a debate round, you know that students have, you could tell them 56 things that they needed to do differently in the round, but they're only gonna remember three or four of them. So it's better to spend time on the three or four most impactful things that they can do the next round than it is to tell them all 56 things and they forget most of them. Um, so you do the, that same thing with candidates. You sort of watch what their message is, you watch how they respond to things, you see where they freak out a little bit and where they get nervous, and then you work on just those three or four things. Uh, it might be pacing, it might be slowing down and making sure your message is really crisp and clear 
for TV or radio or wherever the case may be. Um, it might be phrasing. It might be, hey, I know you were trying to say this, but you used these phrases that are going to offend some people. So let's not do that and do this other one. Uh, it, yeah, it's just really assessing the situation and then identifying the two or three things that are most likely to make an impact that you can work with them on in the time you have allowed. Yeah, that's cool. I haven't really done too much campaigning myself, but I know that in terms of uh, giving feedback for folks that are performing or giving a speech and things like that, uh, definitely translates for debate stuff. I know when I was a younger judge, uh, my RFDs were super long and I'd go like speech by speech and just like, here are all the things to go do in your redo and it would take like however long. But nowadays I've definitely gotten more efficient just sort of like here are three things that you can fix before your next round. The rest, if you want to talk about it, we can talk about it later. Oh, and along those lines, because this is another good tip for being a judge or helping anybody with any speech coaching, whether it's a candidate or somebody else, always include a compliment. Even if you think the person is tough as nails and you think that they don't care about compliments and they're fierce so they don't need it. People don't, it's hard to hear criticism, 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 criticism. People are much more likely to act on the feedback you give them if there's something nice in there as well that they can latch onto as something they didn't know. Yeah, I definitely want to emphasize that too. So for folks that are having practice debates with their novice um, over the summer and things like that, definitely give them some encouragement while you're uh, being critical of things that they need to improve on. Let's see. Awesome. So it looks like we're coming up on the hour. Before we close out, I just want to make a couple quick announcements. One, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, the link for today's merch points are in the chat. So go ahead and open that up. Um, we will be closing it when the stream is over. Um, so make sure you sign up. Um, the more you watch, the more you earn. Um, second, um, look out for details this week about uh, Summer Debate Institute. Uh, as some of you may or may not know, this year is going to be special considering uh, the situation of everything being online. Uh, we will be collaborating with our sister leagues in the Bay and Silicon Valley. So look out for details about that and the registration coming soon. Um, and with that, thank you, Sarah, um, for coming and talking to us out here in LA. Uh, we look forward to working with you this season. Thank you all for having me. This is great. <laughs>